How many times I've turned my Outlook notifications off? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, Carolyn, let's go ahead and get started. Hi, my name is Becky Sanders. I'm the program director for the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center. I want to thank you for joining us today for our webinar series. We're going to hear from Charles James today, and we're focusing, this is the first of three different webinars in a series focused on federally qualified health centers. We are going to record this today. We will make it available both on our YouTube page and Charles is going to share his slides with us and we'll put those along with a link to the YouTube page on our website under archived webinars. We encourage you to hold your questions till the end today and put those in the Q&A function so that if there are questions we can't answer immediately, we can get those to Charles so that he can do the necessary research and get back to you. So without further ado, Charles, I'm gonna hand everything over to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Let me make sure my slides are working here. They are. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center, Indiana Rural Health Association. We were just talking about French Lick. We all would like to be in French Lick. And so please stay tuned for, we're just talking the June conference. Hopefully we'll all get to see each other and we'll be maybe coming out of this crisis we've been in. So in the interim, we are indeed here to talk about payer mix and reimbursement challenges and potential for FQHCs, uh, both lookalike and fully funded. So from our perspective today, there's not really going to be a lot of difference between the two in today's conversation. We really are going to have a lot of the same considerations as far as our payer mix. You could make an argument that fully funded, uh, we probably have a lot more programs that do affect our payer mix, but I'm just talking hardcore insurance payer mix, getting the money, right? We really should call this presentation the fee schedule presentation or something maybe more appealing than that. But so much of our payer mix really the considerations are driven enormously by our fee schedule. What we see historically in the work that we do with FQHCs is that our fee schedule kind of doesn't get enough attention. We think that we're FQHCs, we need to keep our prices low, we, which we do, I don't disagree with that. Um, we may have board directives that our prices can only be X and Y. So we have a lot more sensitivity on our fee schedule in FQHCs than even I would suggest as RHCs do, and certainly our, our fee-for-service cousins. Uh, we have much different considerations than they do because first of all, our fee schedule really affects um, our how we're gonna get reimbursed relative to our PPS rate. So our fee schedule has huge ramifications. We have uh, a lot of impact on the Medicare physician fee schedule in our facilities, even though we're FQHCs and we're not paid on the physician fee schedule. So I thought it was important to, we're gonna take a brief look at how to read the fee schedule, how to set your fees based on the Medicare fee schedule. I have some provider enrollment slides, but for time's sake, I'm not gonna go through those in depth, but I just wanna be sure that I point out that of course, we can't have a payer mix conversation unless you're properly enrolled with all of your payers. So, so many of the gaps we see in the revenue cycle are because of enrollment problems that, that we have a kind of misunderstanding of often in our FQHCs, 
and, and that's a potential hazard as well. And then we're gonna look at how those things inform our paramix, our revenue, our reimbursement, make some distinctions between commercial Medicaid MCOs. I wanna talk, of course, we can't have a conversation about paramix without talking about our sliding fee scale. I like to talk about patient balances versus self-pay and how we make sure that we're running eligibility verification on all of our patients. And, and then of course that really feeds directly to scheduling considerations. So how does scheduling, you know, what's that got to do with payer mix? And I will suggest that our everything, our fee schedule and our scheduling processes have a dramatic impact on the per, our performance relative to the patients that are coming to our doors. Now, I have a confession to make. Uh, this is a new presentation. Uh, most of my presentations, I kind of stick to, uh, you know, previously developed content. And some of this is, uh, a lot of it's new. So it could be full of surprises for both of us. <laughs> so my only point is I don't have muscle memory on this presentation. Uh, so pardon me if I fumble a little bit. Now, some of this content, I just recorded for the CRHCP certification for the National Association of Health Medics. Uh, my expertise and ability to speak on this topic comes from my uh, oversight of North American Healthcare Management Services, which we're a billing company. We do a lot of FQHC work, we do a lot of RHC work, uh, but we're down in the weeds with you on these billing considerations. So I'm not some just geeky guy from St. Louis um, that think that, you know, pretends to know something. Uh, we and our team are, are down deep in all of these considerations every single day. So what we have seen the biggest gap that often gets the least attention in FQHCs is our fee schedule. So let's talk about that. Definition, yeah. You know, part of the problem that we have in healthcare is all of us sometimes use a different definition or different semantics for things. So I think it's really careful or really important that we be careful with our language and make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So what's a fee schedule? It's of course our list of charges. Hey Charles, Yes. are you sharing your slides? Or do you mean to be sharing your slides? Oh my goodness, am I not sharing my slides? No. Well, let's see what's happening here. Um, and my screen uh, should be shared, I thought. And oh my goodness, how about now? Perfect. I am so sorry. Let me back up a little bit. You didn't miss anything. You just missed some of my slide structure. That's all. So aside from me talking, payer mix and the fee schedule, provider or won't, these are some of what we're gonna give pretty quickly. And then these payer mix considerations. And I was just getting down to the bottom of that slide and talking about how does our fee schedule and our payer mix really affect scheduling. And here's our fee schedule definition. So pardon me, I think we're caught up now. We didn't miss much. Um, here's a link, you know, I try to cite some of my slides and I've got some resources here too. But so our fee schedule is really just the list of our charges for healthcare services. Sometimes in a hospital environment, we mistake, we have this language of charge master, fee schedule, charge list. So fee schedule is just our charge for services that we have in our clinic. Now, one common error that we see is, we don't see it as much anymore, is that uh, people wanna have separate fee schedules per payer. So some folks have a, med oh, here's our, what do you charge? Well, for Medicare, we charge this. And for Medicare Advantage and for commercial, we charge, no, no, no. We need to have one unique fee schedule for all of our payer, all of our patients, regardless of their payer class, uh, what we can get into if we don't are accusations of discrimination, price fixing, and some nasty words like that that we don't want to have anything to do with. And keep in mind, what's our name? 
federally qualified health center. So we're dealing with federal money. We don't want to mess it up. So we need to have one fee schedule for all of our payers. And, you know, all of our payers have different rules and claim submission requirements, et cetera. So we're going to have different timing and different codes we're going to report. Think about, of course, our G codes, G0467, et cetera, that commercial payers don't recognize. And again, our fee schedule goes directly into populating our G codes, which of course has a direct impact on our reimbursement and how much we get paid per claim. That sounds pretty elementary, but so uh, our fee schedule drives those G code amounts, which drives our Medicare reimbursement. Of course, our fee schedule affects everything. Our payer agreements often say, you know, we're gonna pay, if they have a fee schedule, they'll give you a certain amount per fee. They often, a commercial payer doesn't give you the entirety of their fee schedule. Uh, often they'll say, we're gonna pay on a percentage of charges, which are often based on the Medicare allowable. So our sliding fee scale, we want to have based on discounts, not a separate sliding, not a separate price. So we're gonna base everything we do on one fee schedule and then we're gonna provide discounts for compliance with our sliding fee scale. And of course, needless to say, it drives our revenue, it drives our adjustments, where we set our fees relative to our commercial contracts. It's gonna drive how much we write off every month. And then of course, compliance with each of those payer different rules. You know, sometimes we get nervous because, oh, we have to add this code for G0466, our G code, but our commercials won't take that as a secondary. How do we deal with that? Sometimes we, ooh, is it illegal to change that G code for my secondary claim? No, we're complying with the billing rules for those payers. And as long as we're not making thing up, things up and we're in compliance, why we have a compliance and auditing program, right? We're gonna comply with the billing rules for each of our individual payers. Now here's part of the trick. We're FQHCs. We serve underserved uh, populations. I wanted to say in needy populations. You know what I mean? We serve underserved at-risk populations. That's what I'm looking for. So we can't gouge our patients, but we also have a fiduciary obligation to our organization to maximize revenue and pay to keep the doors open. So we really need to be mindful of what is our objective on fee schedule setting. I can tell you on the Royal Health Clinic side of things, the objective, particularly when hospitals come in, a lot of times what happens is the Royal Health Clinic, their fee schedule gets equated with the hospital and all of a sudden we blow the fees out of the water and, and that's not cool. So what's the middle ground? A lot of FQHCs, frankly, we just see just undercharging for their services, which is not the appropriate route in our view. It's, it's not that it's inappropriate. There's a better route to address our needs of our community, but also maximize our revenue. I'm going to show you that here in a second. So we need our fee schedule to be high enough that we're capturing all of our commercial revenue available to us, but not putting undue burden on our patients, our private pay patients, nor any of our Medicare patients. Because remember, 20% of our charge is the coinsurance amount. So in the FQHC and the REC environment, we have a direct impact of our charge amount on our patient balances. And we have to be really careful that our patients don't get overcharged uh, uh, and get charged more by coming to our facility than they would in another. So that's why this balance is really important. And of course, price fixing and keeping it legal is a big concern. We can't have any whiff of agreement among competitors or any whiff of having surveyed our competitors to set prices. So uh, we need to, to, to uh, be careful not to set fees based on what other providers are charging. And so often, particularly on some listservs, 
um, we'll see the question, hey, how much are you guys charging for a 99213? Uh, no, we can't have that conversation on a listserv. Um, I'm gonna call around to the providers in town and see what they're charging for a 99213. No, don't do that either. And certainly uh, if you do that, don't, don't set your fees based on that. So we gotta be careful of price fixing allegations. And often we don't know, or maybe we do, that when we are arbitrarily waiving or reducing cost sharing to federal beneficiaries, often represents kickbacks. We have to be careful that we don't get in trouble with OIG. Now, this language that I took right here on the slide is rel relative to the public health emergency. There's a perfect illustration that the OIG does consider arbitrary waiving of coinsurance for particularly our Medicare, Medicaid patients. But then if we're waiving coinsurance on commercial patients and we don't waive coinsurance on Medicare, Medicaid, we have a problem. If we waive coinsurance on our commercial patients, we're violating our payer contracts with our commercial payers. Um, we talk about participating agreements and that's part of the participating agreement. You sign with your commercial payers when you become an FQHC and when you do your Medicare fee for service enrollment, you're saying you will not discriminate in any manner against Medicaid, Medicare patients. You're doing the same thing for Medicaid and waiving coinsurance for one class and not the other can be considered a kickback. During the PHE, it's fine for us to waive cost sharing or coinsurance for telehealth visits if we want to. It's a little different topic, but there's been a lot of confusion about what can we charge Medicare patients during the, the public health emergency. The answer is anything COVID related cannot have a coinsurance on it. And have any cost sharing with anything COVID related. So a patient comes in for COVID testing, we got to put the CS modifier on it. They're not, they can't get a copay. If those have been erroneously processed by CMS or whomever, you put a CS modifier on it, claims still came back with coinsurance on it. CMS says they're going to reprocess those claims. So CS modifier, we must waive for anything COVID related. What the OIG is saying, we may waive all of our cost sharing for all telehealth services, regardless of whether or not they're COVID related. So we have some flexibility during the public health emergency, but just in normal times, remember routine waiving of code so that old professional courtesy that Doc used to do to his buddies, we can't do that anymore. Now in James Clinic back in the day, we would always, uh, we would never charge any clergy or uh, highway patrol. So uh, one of my uncles died really early. And we also had some property, all the highway patrol, when they were getting divorced, it comes on our property. But we had a big stream of highway patrol escorts for my uncle. But my point is, we can't do that anymore. We have to charge people their insurance uh, according, to the, according to the contracts we have with those payers. We have to use our customary fees. We're not going to go and set all of our G codes based on what is our PPS rate. We can't do that. We're gonna keep our customary fee schedule. And that really means the fee schedule that we've maintained over the years. Now, one big, huge issue with your payer mix is if you're getting a lot of commercial payments back that are 100% of your charge. If you have payments coming back from your commercial payers, 100% of the charge, your fee schedule needs attention. It's too low. You need to moderate your fee schedule. There's really no set methodology we're required to use as FQHCs or RHCs on how we set our fee schedule. There's no place in the HRSA manual that says you have to set your fees by using this calculation. Now, it is the expectation that we'll use our customary and reasonable fee schedule. That's really part of our participating agreement with Medicare. 
we have a couple of easy methods for setting these fees. When I say easy, you look at all this morass of Medicare and multipliers and RBRVS, and it seems very complicated, and it can be, it is. Uh, we just have to know how to drill through that noise. So let's look at a good way to set our fee schedule. First of all, um, when you go out and look at your max fee schedule, I took this off of CMS, you have multiple fee schedules. So you're gonna have to take parts from three different Medicare fee schedules in order to develop your charge master, if you will. We really need this clinical laboratory fee schedule. You see the link is coming up on here. Your Mac, go to your MAX website. If we're WPS or NGS, um, who else do we have up north? I can't think off the top, CGS, excuse me. Um, so go to your Mac for these. I pulled these because we have so we should ha should have people with multiple Macs on here today. This will be our so these will be of course all of our eight thousand codes right here. You'll pull up the physician physician fee schedule. You won't have the eight thousand codes on here. I'm missing part of this. Nor on the physician fee schedule where you have drug pricing like our J codes. Those are all on this drug pricing file. So in order to develop your fee schedule, we need to download the CLIA lab fee schedule, the physician fee schedule, and this drug pricing fee schedule. There's gonna be a locality in there. I think Indiana splits between one, two, and 99, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, states like uh, Kansas, for example, have just one locality. But I know Illinois, we have four or five. Michigan, I would think, I think Michigan's got three or four. But in general, if in doubt, go pull locality 99. So the other choice that will confound you a little bit is you'll get a locality choice. Pull locality 99 is what you want. That means for all other areas outside of the urban area. Then when you go pull up, this is the physician fee schedule. This happens to be Missouri. You can see a lot of other noise on there. And there's non-par amount, limiting charge. Don't mess with that stuff. That's for non-participating providers. It's never going to apply to us. We're by virtue, by nature, by default, participating providers. Your fee schedules are all going to look a little different as far as how they're structured, but they're going to have all the same basic information. And what we see here are these uh, items denoted by a pound sign. I call it a pound sign. I don't care if it's hashtag. I'm old. I'm going to call it a pound sign or a number sign. So it's a number sign, whippersnappers. The number sign there indicates a facility fee schedule. We don't want to use that because that's for our provider-based folks. We want to use the fee that does not have the, the number sign next to it to use to develop our fee schedule. And you can pull these via Excel and then sort it and just wipe out all, you know, sort it by this note and then wipe all those out and you've got left and what we can do is then we're going to take each one of those and again if you do it in excel you're going to choose your multiplier i would suggest as fqhc's for e m codes you probably want something at the 150 percent range of that medicare allowable we just saw so all we're going to do is we're going to take the locality 99 allowable we're going to multiply it by 1.25 1.50 whatever is your choice and then round always round up MBA type of guy, you ran them up. So then you get your suggested fee. It's as simple as that. I like to get a little fancier even, and I like to put our evaluation and management codes or all of our minor surgical procedures as well at 150 and then do everything else at 200%. There's no set formula you have to use on this, but you really do need a consistent methodology to set those fees. This RBRVS that we hear so much about, you know, uh, often we can look at compensation models that take RB RVS into account. Uh, this is what sets a relative value for physician work, overhead, malpractice coverage. And every year we get a new RBF, RB, RBRVS schedule. And you can follow the link there, et cetera. But by default, when we use the Medicare allowable to develop our fees, we're using 
the RBRVS system is built into what we're doing because that's how this fee schedule gets set up. So here's my point. Look at your fee schedule relative to the Medicare allowable and determine where you, where you are. If you haven't had a fee schedule update in a long time, more than a couple of years, a lot I've run into so many people will see, you know, five years we haven't updated our fee schedule. You can't go and equalize with 150% of the fee schedule overnight. And that's why I like a differential like this, because then you can, yes, overnight boost everything to equal 200% of Medicare or 150% and then take your evaluation and management codes and just do a five or six or 8% increase for the year this year, then do it again next year and, and get your fees equalized. What I can tell you is if you haven't done that on your fee schedule, you're costing yourself money on your G payment codes because that G payment code is really the basket of our most common uh, basket of services for our evaluation and management patients or for our established and new patients, right? So we really need to look at our fee schedules. Your payers are all basing their payment to you on the fee schedule, and we have this lesser of cost to charge. So for the sake of time, I'm moving fairly quickly, but we know Medicare is gonna pay us 80% of our, the lesser of our actual charge or look, the specific payment code amount. It's, whoops, pardon me. I have a little trouble seeing with my Zoom. Uh, there we go, let's do that. 80% of the lesser of the RHC the actual charge for the specific payment code or the adjusted PPS amount. So remember, we're going to adjust our PPS rate that comes out from our cost report or whatever that mechanism is that you've got at this point, if you're already PPS. Um, and the patient's responsible for 20% of our actual charge for the payment code or the adjusted PPS rate. So look here, when we report our detail down here, our office visit, so maybe our most common basket of services are a evaluation and management and a venipuncture. And so our G code is $150 on a $135 office visit. The patient is gonna pay 20% of the payment code. So if it seems elementary and obvious to say, our fee schedule has a dramatic impact on how much money we make. That's a stupid statement. But we see as a direct impact on A, whether or not we get our PPS rate or whether or not it's cost of charge. So if we have an artificially low fee schedule, we're never, ever going to get our PPS rate because it's our compensation. Medicare is always going to pay based on the charge amount. So if your charges are low, you're costing yourself money obviously in terms of your fee schedule, but then because you're never going to get your PPS rate as reimbursement. So I walked through a quick exercise there where we compare, we adjusted uh, the, the reimbursement here. So we have, again, my Zoom is hiding things for me a little bit. So I'm having a little bit of, there we go, let's do it that way. We had a charge, remember that was the, from the pay code, the G code. We have a PPS rate of 168.22, and we have our geographic adjustment that gets applied so that our adjusted PPS rate, excuse me, we have a base rate of 158.85. We have a geographic adjustment to the positive that gets us our adjusted PPS of 168.22, but our G code is 150. So Medicare is gonna pay us 80% of 150, patient's gonna pay 20% of 150, our total payment, magically, not mysterious, is going to be our charge amount, but you can see we're not going to get our PPS rate, and we never will if our charges are dramatically understated. Our PPS rates get increased every year by the Medicare Economic Index. We just had a rate update come out uh, that the Medicare physician fee schedule annual final rule generally includes FQHC, Medicare Economic Index increases. And this year's they came out and increased it. Let's see, beginning of the reporting period, they'll be increased. That's from the FQHC manual. 
and ours this year is 1.7%. So, excuse me, 2.4% increase. Uh, the basket was updated, blah, blah, blah. You can read it. I'm getting, this is why I'm not an accountant. But the annual PPS update comes directly from the Medicare physician fee schedule final rule. So there is a big impact. I'm going to give short shrift of these enrollment pieces. But I just wanted to put it out here that we have all of these different enrollment functions that we have to be sure as FQHCs. I, I have gotten call a lot of calls, and not a lot because we have fewer FQHCs out there. The calls in the past were, hey, I got my HRSA approval. We're an FQHC, we're ready to bill, but nothing was ever done with uh, the Medicare 855, 855B, et cetera, in order to actually bill. So we have a big problem there. We can't miss the PECOS system and, and all of us should be familiar with CAQH. So we have all of these enrollment issues. Uh, we have the identity and access system. That's your portal into any of these systems. You have to set your own individual identity and access up. This recently changed. If you notice here, we had authorized official. Access manager is the old delegated official. So now we have an access manager and we have access to all of these functions on PECOS. We have to have that identity and access system to get into the MPPES system. Again, I'm not going to go through these where I want to uh, get to more Paramix related content, but I did include these in here. CAQH, if anybody cares, here's your useless trivia, stands for Council for Affordable Quality Healthcare. This is really our enrollment portal for all of our commercial payers we see here. So if we're talking about payer mix uh, and we don't talk about getting enrolled via CAQH, you know, we're not paying attention to what we should be. So CAQH is really the driver for your commercial enrollment. Your FQHC CCN number comes out of a Part A institutional provider. 855A is for us. Your FQHCs, you should have a group, a Medicare Part B group and individual provider set up. That would be for our non-FQHC services. That's for what we're going to build outside of our PPS rate. So we'll never bill fee for service for FQHC services, but for those lab services internally, for technical components. And if your providers go to the hospital at all, uh, you'll need Part B. And that's the 855 Part B, or excuse me, 855 B is the group or organization, uh, we tie those back to groups and organizations with an 855I, which is an individual enrollment. So our individual providers get enrolled in 855I, we reassign benefits back to that group via the 855R. This is all for the non-FQHC revenue stream, but it's important to have these enrollments set up so you can adequately bill all of the services that you're rendering. Remember, we have to be able to provide these basic lab services as FQHCs, even though they don't get billed as part of our FQHC encounter. So, so of course, part of our payer mix consideration is making sure that we're properly enrolled, not just for our FQHC revenue stream, but for all of the non-FQHC services that we're required to provide, even though they don't get paid as part of our encounter. INR is where we need to go. Uh, we get that FQHC CMS certification number under an 855A. Um, we're never going to bill our non-FQHC services using our Part B enrollment, but we still have to have one. And of course, Every state has their own Medicaid process. First, you're going to have to get enrolled as an FQHC, and then you're going to tie your individual providers back to that FQHC enrollment. The biggest revenue gap and payer mix consideration, especially for any new FQHCs or RHCs for that matter, is MCO enrollment. Um, we all know the golden rule, right? They with the gold make the rules. Our MCOs right now, our Medicaid MCOs have all the juice. 
So what ends up happening is when we become an FQHC, we have to first apply to Medicaid and typically get our, our, our FQHC flag on our NPI number at the straight Medicaid level. And then we have to separately pursue our Medicaid MCO enrollment as an FQHC, but we can't do that without the straight Medicaid enrollment. We can't apply for the MCO before the straight Medicaid enrollment. Sometimes we have to wait all the way till we get our rate to apply for Medicaid MCO. But then the Medicaid MCO will never recognize anything retroactive back from normally when they just approve the application. So Medicaid MCO gets our enrollment application we became an FQHC in June 1 of 2020. Uh, we may not, we can't apply for Medicaid until we have our CCN number for Medicare. Now we apply for straight Medicaid. We finally got that. Now we're going to apply for Medicaid MCO. Now it's January. Medicaid MCO is not going to approve us until March. So we've got 10, nine months in there that we're not going to have an ability to pay for most of our Medicaid volume. So now we see that most of our Medicaid volume is with Medicaid MCOs. If you're not enrolled in that Medicaid MCO, you're gonna drive a giant red pit into your financial statements. So this is where we see all types of organizations, provider-based rural health clinics, independent rural health clinics, FQHCs really get hung up in this process because then we have stasis so it also takes just staying on top of them you can't just think oh we've sent the application eh, it's been 60 days and just wait to hear uh -uh. send the application make sure they got it two weeks in start hammering them 30 days in hammer them harder and then when you get the approval and they only approve that forward effective date go back and argue you know, you need to at least approve you try to get your initial fqhc date they won't go back to that but try to get approved for the date that the application was submitted to them the date they received the application we can often go back and get them to recognize that date if we push really hard but this is a built-in ripoff and We've tried a lot of legislative remedies across various states to, to remedy this, but the you know, water finds the hole, right? This is a huge issue. And on top of that, uh, we have other ramifications. We don't get our FQHC reconciliation payment on unpaid uh, MCO encounters. So we have to have a paid MCO encounter to get our wrap. Um, we often have a prior authorization or a PCP requirement on our MCOs. And if our clinic is not that patient's MCO, we won't get paid for the claim. We won't get our wrap. We'll be left with a zero. So we have a lot of ramifications on this MCO enrollment from being able to get your full reimbursement to just having a claim to bill in the first place. So it just can't understate how important this MCO enrollment is. And we've got some kind of wrap process that happens with these MCOs. The MCOs is not an automatic enrollment. You got to pursue the MCO yourself. And if you don't, again, you'll be left with some major zeros. We got our Medicare and our Medicaid fee for service. Remember, our Medicare fee for service is going to involve. Uh, those non-FQHC services like our lab that we must provide, but don't get billed on our FQHC revenue stream. Most of what we know as our commercial payers are some kind of discounted fee for service, which is ultimately some form of managed care when we start talking about preferred provider organizations, which is what most of them are. Most of those are PPOs that we have a discounted fee for service reimbursement model on. And the managed care aspect is that 
they have their network of providers and that's our whole in network out of network thing and that gets highly problematic for us if we haven't gotten through those enrollment pieces of course we have more value-based care organizations and acos coming online and where a lot of that is not claim based some of it is we also have quality measures that we'll have to submit some of our managed care now if we submit quality measures with our commercial payers often there are uh, value-based payments to be achieved there on the commercial side that we don't get on the fqhc rhc side that are not available to us yet so remember we're mostly discounted ppos it's where the in-network provider thing comes in and most of us have an allowable amount for in-network providers most often based on a medicare fee schedule or they release you a fee that that mirrors pretty closely the medicare fee schedule and the big key is if you're getting a lot of 100 percent payments on your commercial we need to moderate so sliding fee scale rural health clinics are not required to have a sliding fee scale you as fqhcs are i'm sure i don't have to tell you any of you that part of your site audits become audits of that sliding fee scale right you're automatically enrolled as a facility HIPSA and automatically a loan repayment site by nature of becoming an FQHC. So you have to offer a sliding fee scale. We have to see all patients regardless of their ability to pay. That doesn't mean we don't have reasonable collection processes in place because we want to be able to report our Medicare bad debt on our cost report. So I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of collection processes. But basically what has to happen is if you send anything out to a collection agency, you got to pull all of your balances back from the collection agency so that you can report Medicare bad debt on the cost report that goes into treating everybody the same. So we have to pull Medicare back from a collection agency in order to report it on our cost report. But that means we have to pull everybody from that same period back. So basically it means we have to have a process or, you know, once we're going to report Medicare balances and those comparable commercial balances would also come back from a collection agency. Talk to your cost report preparation folks in order to get that straight. So we're going to discount our citing fee scales based on our fee schedule. These we know are based on family size and poverty level. Um, we What we need to do is use a discount from our fee schedule, from our unique singular fee schedule and of course we know that our income verification our signage and our applications will be audited uh, by HRSA. now here's the thing we don't see some of our folks do better jobs than others on getting people into their sliding fee scale we definitely have the problem of particularly on the rhc side uh, where people just don't want to come claim their poverty. I, I get it. I wouldn't want to. So we have low utilization of our sliding fee scale, I think, primarily for that reason. Because somebody has to come in, provide income verification, and, you know, claim your poverty. And I, I think for that reason, uh, sliding fee scales become difficult. But it also then becomes essential that we're doing patient eligibility verification because we want to be sure that what we may have as a Medicaid patient isn't a self-pay patient that we need to apply our sliding fee scale to. So just for all payer mix, all revenue cycle considerations, verifying patient eligibility is just a highly critical function, particularly in my view for us. I think a lot of us think, oh, well, we don't have much commercial insurance. I think it's the opposite. I think that be given our kind of at-risk mix that we have in FQHCs, patient eligibility verification becomes even more important. We should have an eligibility verification built into your EHR that runs in some kind of batch mode. Many of us are still having to go out and dink per website, per patient to do that. And I would suggest a better software solution. We have to collect accurate demographic accurate insurance information check eligibility at every visit make sure we're capturing the reason for the visit and the reason for all these is so we can capture anybody that's uh, 
potentially eligible for the sliding fee scale are our charity care and that we have adequate payment terms communicated to the patients so they know what the expectation will be. A lot of us have pretty brutal payer mixes in our FQHCs, right? You know, a regular fee for service operation, it wouldn't allow more than one or 2% self pay uninsured. And we typically run much larger percentages in our uninsured. So that is why it's even more critical to be able to track these balances. Now, here's an example on a report that I pulled. And we see over here, here's what I want to highlight on this. We have sliding fee scale of these columns represent each aging bucket. So this right here, 25%, 769, those would be current charges. So we see we have this, we have good utilization of our sliding fee scale here. But look at our self-pay, our straight self-pay on this. This is a clinic. Our straight self-pay, whoops, is, yeah, I didn't want to do that. Our straight self-pay is current is $2,000, okay? Not a huge amount. Look over here, we have a total of $11,000 or so between self-pay. I'm looking at this patient balance column. But look at our patient balances. So while we have large, or excuse me, we don't have what I consider significant self-pay or sliding fee scale, we have large patient balances in this. And so in this operation, that represents uh, just over 20% of the net revenue. So while our mission is to serve our self-pay and our sliding fee scale patients, we've got significant patient balances we need to look at. I looked at a couple of our Medicare on this. So look, so we have some Medicare fee for service. We have these lab services that we're talking about here. But I also, what I want to emphasize here is how much is Medicare. And then honestly, I couldn't come up with good information like this on the Medicaid side. It just didn't work very well. Um, so I just wanted to look and demonstrate what a couple of these payer mixes might uh, look like. What are your top payers? You know, we have all kinds of insurance that we deal with, but we probably have five that represents 80% of your business. So are they returning good eligibility information with their verification processes? Are you, is eligibility being confirmed at every visit? Are you capturing who are Medicaid MCO patients? Do you have a high volume of unable to ID patient or patient ineligible at the time of service. If you have a high volume of those denials, your front end process is broken somehow. We're not getting accurate demographics, we're not getting accurate insurance information, we're not checking eligibility, and we're driving up our self-pay balances and our unpaid, we're, we're, we're affecting our revenue cycle at that point. How many are we missing, how many of our denials so we're talking about a denial analysis here. We're talking about, in a second, we're gonna talk about no-show rates. What of our payers require our patients to have named us as PCP, and is there a prior auth requirement? Particularly on behavioral health, there's, there could very likely be a prior auth requirement. Are you looking at your schedules? Particularly, are you reminding patients that they need to come in so that we drive down our no-show rate. This is one of our problems is our FQHC requirement to see all patients regardless of ability to pay. We typically run painful no-show rates. So can we, can our scheduling plan moderate our no-shows? Do we know when we miss or we have more no-shows than others? Uh, do you have a missed appointment policy? We can have a missed appointment policy. It just needs to be equally implemented across the board. And we have to be able to, we have to see all patients regardless of ability to pay, but that need, does not mean that we have to uh, change what our policies are in order to have them seen. So we can't miss appointments. We have a missed appointment policy. Often in FQHCs, we don't want to put a financial penalty on there. We have problems with Medicaid patients doing that, uh, but communicate a missed, uh, a missed appointment policy to drive down that no-show rate. Make sure and look at that no-show rate, 
look at your utilization rate to determine what by pair mix maybe are the patients that are not showing up. If we're missing patient demographics and unable to identify patient, we're, we're going to miss a big part of our revenue stream. Make sure that our receptionists are asking open questions, not closed questions. An open question is, could you please verify your current address? A closed question is, are you still at 123 Oak Street? Of course, we have HIPAA considerations there in the waiting room. Um, how often are your patient registration forms updated? And are you capturing driver's license, driver's license and insurance card information? Are you communicating these patient balances at every visit? Of course, our commercial uh, patients, it's just as important to communicate those balances. The biggest driver of accounts receivable that we see in FQHCs, uncollected patient balances. We're not dealing with patient balances. You saw in the example earlier, there's a nice tight AR we were running on that. And it's because we're really managing those patient balances. The second the patient walks out the door, I know it's painful to ask at risk, risk patients. We have a sliding fee scale, but you capture it at the door. The second that patient walks out the door, that balance is 100% colder, especially if we're talking about one Z, two Z dollar, seven dollar coinsurance. We have to address that at the door, at the checkout, and everybody will be happier. Patient balances should represent 20% of our revenue, and it's a huge source of missed revenue and accounts receivable. Transpose ID numbers and bad insurance information entry is also another reason we must constantly be uh, confirming these at every uh, visit. So I had to stop someplace, and that's where I chose to stop. You know, you can see from the conversation, it's as much a fee schedule and a workflow at the front end question for your payer mix uh, when, you're, when you're trying to, to maximize that payer mix. It really all starts with the fee schedule. Charles James Sr., I am Charles James Jr., and I learned a lot from Charles James Sr. And he always told us, if you're not looking at the controls, you're not flying the plane. So we have to, our control in this instance is our fee schedule. How long has it been since we've updated? What is our enrollment? Are we properly enrolled? Is our workflow sound? Are we capturing the data at the front end that we need to? And then on the back end, are we dealing with patient balances as required for that patient class? So I hope that you got something out of this today and we've got just a few minutes left for questions. And uh, if we can go ahead and open up the floor. Um, honestly, I probably don't have all of the sources that I refer to in here, but the Bible is always chapter 13 of the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual and chapter nine of the Medicare Claims Processing Manual. So, so good. Well, um, do we have any questions floating out there from the panel? Charles, I just want to say thank you so much. I learned lots of Okay, good. Fantastic. So I appreciate very much your time with us. I don't see any questions yet. <clears throat> well, that can be good or bad. Yeah, but yeah. It could be they're digesting everything because there was a ton of information there. Not a uh, just wanted to point out a couple of things, and I'm going to start with the easy one first. I mean, a quote by your father. Um, so I have to ask, are you a pilot as well? I've always wanted to be one. Uh, but no, I am not currently, but I am fascinated with aircraft. Okay. Yes. I've got college to get through before I can get that pilot, pilot license, you know. Ah, okay. All right. <laughs> Pursuit of higher education. Right. Um, I want to thank all of our participants for being with us today as well. 
And we do have uh, just a short survey. Um, since we are federally funded, we always do uh, request feedback to make sure that we're hitting the mark with our programs. And while I'm looking for that link to the survey, I'm also seeing no additional questions, but I did want to ask, um, Charles, it's, for me, um, it's, it's hard to keep things straight in my head between FQHCs and RHCs. Mm -hmm. Have you, with your years of working with this, come up with a good way to keep things straight in your head? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. I mean, you know, I think the way I, I, the way I like to think about it is that the Medicare guidance for the two is all largely the same. We have the same providers. We're going to see tomorrow how that we have common behavioral health providers. We have the same service definitions in general. You know, hands and eyes on the patients, incident to services, etc. We're going to cover that in depth in the January 12th EM session. So we have all of the kind the common definitions, visit definitions, and counter definitions, but as soon as we start to drop a claim, they go totally separate ways. So we have the same definitions, but our billing process is totally different because of that G code. Mm -hmm. And RHCs don't have the PPS rate. I would love, so keep in mind, RHCs are not paid on PPS yet. So the, that encounter rate setting is dramatically different between the two. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. So let's go ahead and wrap up for today and look forward to tomorrow. Yes. Behavioral health and, and substance abuse. Absolutely. Another fascinating topic that is so important in yes. these days. Well, all right. thank, well, thank you, you all. And mm -hmm. Absolutely. Take care, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.